a pleasure to be here. My name is Patrice McCarran. I'm the executive director of the Maine Lobstermen's Association. I've been with MLA for over 22 years. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the challenges that are threatening our fishing heritage. And there are many. Um, so the overview is I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the association itself, talk about the importance of the lobster fishery, and then delve in for the most part to offshore wind um, as an emerging issue that we're dealing with, as well as the federal whale plan, which has been the big issue that we've been dealing with. So the MLA advocates for a sustainable lobster resource and the fishermen and communities that depend on it. We've been around since 1954. We are the oldest and largest fishing association on the main coast, or actually on the east coast. Um, and we try to focus on the issues that are related to sustaining our heritage. That there's a lot that goes on. There's a lot that intersects with lobster. Um, so we really try to work at a higher level and leave some of the more local issues to the zone councils um, and the other systems that are in place to deal with that. So the industry is the economic backbone of the main coast. Um, we are currently the second most valuable fishery in the nation. We kind of bump back and forth nationally between first and second, um, bumping up against um, salmon and crab sometimes um, on the west coast and the swallow fishery in New Bedford is also very valuable. We are well over a billion dollar industry and 80% of all of the value of Maine's commercial fisheries comes from lobster. So there's a lot of concern about the vulnerability of our coastal communities if something were to happen to lobster. And I think everybody's familiar with the story of how much um, the lobster resource itself has actually increased in abundance. It's not that we put more traps out or recruited more people to fish, the actual abundance of lobster itself has increased. Um, those landings started cranking up in earnest in the 90s and the majority of that expansion occurred in Southern Maine. Um, those landings remained stable and then during the 2000s, we really saw the mid coast area start to crank up its landings. Those have maintained since then and over the past um, 10 or so years, it's really been down East Maine where the majority of those landings are coming in. We had our best year for value in 2021, um, staggeringly high, $725 million. We were closer to the 500 millions before that and even a little bit lower, but the fishery has sustained landings of over a hundred million pounds almost every year since 2011, um, which as you see from these landings was truly unimaginable not that long ago. Um, I would be remiss in not pointing out just how important Stonington is in this situation. So these are uh, Maine's top 10 ports over the last five years, and this time series would look similar if we went back um, in time um, 10 plus years. Um, in 2021, Stonington as a port um, sailed directly to the boats, no value added, um, was over $73 million planted in Stonington, which is crazy. Um, Vinyl Haven, a close second at 55 million. And you can look down the list, towns like Friendship, Beals, Portland, Sprucehead, Southwest Harbor, um, very small communities realizing significant income direct to the vessel um, over the last five years. The reason that that is so important to the Maine coast is that every operation in Maine, every lobster boat is owned and operated by the captain. That is by law, nobody owns a fleet of lobster boats that they hire captains to do. So we have 4,800 lobstermen. That means we have 4,800 small businesses. Every person lives and works in their local communities. So the fishery is local. The money that we earn, all that $73 million, there are no corporate headquarters outside of Maine. It stays local. The fishery itself, talking about the boat only, um, over 10,000 jobs between the captain and the sternmen um, actively working in our fleet. So it truly is the economic driver for our coastal economy. And the reason the fishery has been so incredibly strong is in large part due to the sustainability measures that we've had in place. So protecting egg bearing females, we have size limits, we throw the little ones back and the big ones back. We train um, our incoming fishermen through the apprentice program and we have restrictions on harvest. Um, and I'm gonna let uh, lobstermen from Casco Bay um, show you what that is. 
Hey everybody, my name is Kurt Brown. I'm a lobsterman and a marine biologist at Ready Seafood up here in Maine. Today we're going to show you how we sustainably harvest lobster. And we're going to walk you through every step in the process right now. The only way you can legally harvest a lobster here in Maine is with a trap. Every lobster that comes up gets measured. If a lobster is too small, it goes back in the ocean. This one right here doesn't make the cut. So back it goes. If a lobster is legal size, then this measure touches the carapace. And look at that. It's a legal size lobster right there. That's a keeper. If a lobster is too big, it also has to go back into the ocean. These provide lobsters for the next generation. Very important that these stay on the bottom of the ocean. This lobster right here, we don't even need to measure. This is a female lobster with eggs. She is required to go back in the ocean to release her eggs and give us another generation of lobsters. Before she goes back, we're required to cut a V-notch into her tail flipper. That signifies that she's a proven breeder and she gets a free pass for the rest of her life. Lobstering here in Maine is about so much more than just catching lobsters. It's about protecting all the marine life we have around us. And we do that in a number of different ways, starting with our marker buoys. Everybody has their own colors. My buoy colors are brown and green. And I decided on those colors when I was a kid because those were the two paint colors in my parents' garage. Below the buoy, we have what's called a weak link. This weak link right here is designed to break away should any marine life get tangled in our end line. Beyond that, we have purple marker rope and another purple gear marking right at the trap. This purple rope here signifies that this line is from Maine should the trap ever get lost. The only way you can legally harvest a lobster in Maine is with traps. So let's haul this one up. I'll show you the rest of what we do to protect marine life here in Maine. Every single trap in Maine is required to have a trap tag. This ensures that nobody fishes over the legal limit so that there's never too much gear in the water. On the trap itself, we have what's called an escape vent. This vent right here is essentially a hole in the trap that allows small lobsters and any other marine life that gets into the trap to get back out. There has not been a documented right whale entanglement with Maine lobster gear in over 15 years. And that is the result of all that you see right here. That's something that we're very, very proud of. So nothing like seeing that firsthand. So that's, you know, that's what we're trying to protect, protect. And we are facing significant challenges and just a quick timeline of what, what is pending for us over the next few years. Um, this year, we implemented a 60% risk reduction to protect right whales. Um, probably read a lot about that in the news. Um, the lobster market right now is very volatile. We've seen a correction in the boat price for lobster relative to last year. And it's really making the profitability of the fleet very marginal due to the increased cost structure to the lobstermen themselves. Next year, we're looking at full implementation of mandatory harvester reporting and vessel tracking on federal boats, um, something that we need information wise, but timing wise, very, very difficult for our fleet to cope with because we have so much else that we're dealing with right now. Uh, one of the ma management agencies is also potentially looking at increasing the minimum gauge size, um, changing the vent size, V-notch sizes, so other changes potentially on the horizon. And National Marine Fisheries Service has let us know that our 60% risk reduction that we just did is not enough, and we immediately need to achieve a 90% risk reduction. So um, we don't have a timeline on that, but fully expect to see that moving through in 2023. Um, and as if that's not enough, um, BOEM, the federal agency that does offshore wind leasing, will be leasing the Gulf of Maine to offshore wind companies in 2024. The schedule is set for that. Um, so just real quick, the, the reporting stuff is important in terms of information that we need to be dealing with the issues that we're coping with. The timing of this stinks. Um, this stuff was voted on five years ago and implementation is 2023, but now we're looking at 100% harvester reporting. So lobstermen telling the government what they're doing day to day, what they're landing, what they're selling. 
And then in addition, the federal fleet will have to do electronic trackers on the boats themselves so that we expand the spatial footprint. So we will be looking for implementation, you know, really within six months for these. Um, the other thing coming from the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which I should probably spend an hour on in and of itself, but one slide today, um, we're looking at possible changes uh, to increase the gauge size because over the last five years, all of the surveys and monitoring that we do of the lobster stock have shown a decline, so a declining trend for five years. Um, so the managers are asking, can the main lobster fishery sustain landings of under 100 million pounds, or do we need to take action to put more protection on the lobster um, to sort of stabilize the industry economically? So it's very much up in question what's going to happen, but they have some very substantive proposals to, to go through a series of gauge increases, which would also be a significant adjustment for our fleet. Um, so I'm going to pivot to offshore wind. I'm going to talk briefly about the, the different things that have been going on, the research array, changes to our law, our planning process, the roadmap, and then the federal government's pending leasing of the Gulf of Maine. So for the research array, um, this is something that the um, governor's energy office proposed to try to get ahead of commercial development in the Gulf of Maine, doing something that's sort of considered pre-commercial scale, so a little bit smaller than something that you would do to really be providing energy commercially, and do research and learn about how that research array will affect our environment and our fishery. Um, that was announced in November of 2020. Um, they used the interim time to work with the fishing industry and ultimately selected a site for that. In October of 2021, they applied to the federal agency for that lease for the research array. Um, it encompasses 15 square miles or 10,000 acres, and it would have 12 floating turbines on it and produce 144 megawatts of electricity if it were to go forward. Um, surprise to a lot of people, um, we learned in May that the federal agency is actually going to put out a competitive request um, to see if there are any other wind developers interested in developing the site that the state of Maine had chosen. So we're hoping that this research array ultimately goes through so that we have some learning before the really big offshore wind developments start in our waters. Um, and just real quick, the, the state of Maine had originally identified a 770 square mile area working with the Maine Department of Marine Resources. They narrowed that down to 56 square miles and then ultimately DMR working closely with fishermen tried to identify the really important fishing bottom and ultimately narrow that down to the 15 square miles. And you can see this little green kind of left facing rectangular hook. That is the footprint of the research array. And just for scale, you can see the whale closure behind it and start to get a sense of cumulatively, well, we might only be talking about 12 turbines but when you look at that along with the whale closure, you can see for fishermen in that area, it is a pretty significant piece of bottom that is going to be affected. Um, just as sort of a, you should know this, um, the state legislature has been very busy planning for offshore wind development. So the Public Utilities Commission um, is working on a purchase agreement to fund the research array. So that would be to buy electricity at above market cost so that the research can be conducted. Um, and then the governor put a bill through and ultimately banned any new offshore wind projects in Maine state waters, as well as created a formal research consortium to try to uh, bring stakeholders together in the state to really dig into some of the pressing research questions about how offshore wind will affect our ecosystems and our fisheries as well. Um, so the second piece of this is the offshore wind planning process, the roadmap. Um, the fishing industry was pretty upset out of the gate that this didn't come first. This came second to the research array. It seemed a bit counterintuitive that you would build, <laughs> build a, a wind site without doing the plan first, but this is how it went. Um, so in 2020, the state of Maine received $2 million federal dollars um, to do this. The following July of 2021, they officially convened the Offshore Wind Roadmap Advisory Committee. I sit on that as a fishing industry members, and they also formed four working groups, one dedicated to fisheries, and many, many members of the fishing industry have put in a lot of time on that. Um, so anybody who's heard that the fishing industry is not helping, cooperating, 
Um, we are. We're going to a lot of meetings and putting in a lot of time. Um, this summer, they've been releasing some of the planning studies, so some of the build out, how many turbines might we see, what will the socioeconomic impacts be, um, and they're looking to finalize that plan in November. So the draft strategies are um, have been reviewed by the committee and will probably be released pretty soon. For the fisheries working group itself, just to, for you to know what we were working on, um, we want robust research and monitoring plans and have recommendations for that. Um, looking for better communication and accountability from the offshore wind developers themselves to the fishing industry to add some transparency to that. Um, looking at some of the navigation and safety issues that putting you know, 900 foot turbines in the water would pose. Um, and then where do we put them and what information do we need to map to do that well, as well as a lot of concerns and recommendations about how to cable um, and transmit that energy back to the mainland. Um, so I'll share with you our, our key recommendation, what I think is the most important. We got together as a group of fishing industry stakeholders, not just lobster, but herring and scallops and aquaculture and everybody else. Um, and our proposal is to minimize the impact on the majority of the fishing industry. So um, inside um, this 40 mile line from shore, um, it's like 250,000 trips take place a year. And outside of it, it's less than 10,000. Um, so we are recommending that offshore wind development only happen outside of that line. So it's roughly between 40 and 50 miles from shore, depending on where you measure from. Um, in addition to protecting the economic value of fisheries that make their living there, it also protects a lot of very sensitive habitats, um, including whale habitats, and it would provide um, predictability for developers. So the fishing industry would be committed to working with offshore wind developers to find sites outside um, and not try to jump around this highly fished area where you're just sort of going from one stakeholder group to the next guys, you know, one zone over um, and just constantly being in a battle because all of those fishing grounds are so incredibly important to um, everybody who fishes in Maine. Um, one of the big looming questions we've had um, for the state is how many offshore wind turbines is the fishing industry needing to plan to coexist with, as they put it. Um, and we just got the preliminary run from their consultant and in the scenario where we have to decarbonize to meet all of the goals that the individual states have made and assuming that Maine will be producing wind for the region because we don't have an economy for scale to only produce for ourselves. Um, the scenario is here on the right. Um, they predict that we would need 11,216 megawatts of offshore wind um, at just about current technology, um, that would be 800 turbines. And if the turbines were, you know, graduating to producing 20 megawatts um, within five or, or plus years, um, it would still be 560 turbines. So that is a massive footprint um, for our industry to coexist. So that would be in the Gulf of Maine to produce electricity for the region. Um, you'll hear the fishing industry refer to offshore wind development as an industrialization, and this is why. Um, current technology in 2021 is a 12 megawatt turbine. It is 853 feet tall. Um, we are proposing to, well, not we, the state of Maine, to put those on floating platforms, which are 300 feet by 300 feet, um, with a very large footprint to cable those to the bottom. Um, this is a BOEM slide, so they're anticipating, you know, years out, they may have 50 megawatt turbines, which would still be 225. So we would fall somewhere in between, um, potentially getting to a 20 megawatt turbine, we're still looking at over 500. So it is a very, very big impact on the fishery and floating technology is new and the ecological ramifications of what it means to put that out there are, are pretty much unknown at this point in time. So jumping to BOEM, the federal process itself, um, the Biden administration wants to produce 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Um, they've identified several regions around the country to do that, and they've slated the Gulf of Maine to be leased in 2024. Um, they've kickstarted that process and they've identified the entire Gulf of Maine right now, um, and they'll be going through requests for information to start to 
back out sensitive areas like the little research array is backed out right now um, because somebody's already spoken for it. Um, so this, this potential footprint will shrink through the process, but essentially everything's on the table with the exception of our state waters and the research array right now. Um, and here is their timeline um, looking to actually hold their auction in quarter three of 2024. So that is very, very scary for the fishing industry, trying to wrap our heads around what that will actually mean for us. So that is the quick and dirty on offshore wind. So now I'm going to pivot to right whales, which has been the issue that's really consumed all of our time for the last five years. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, our conservation record, our interactions with right whales, and then get to the actual 10-year plan, which we feel is threatening our the future of our fishing heritage. Um, so right whales are highly endangered. Nobody can test that issue. There are less than 400 whales remaining right now. I think the official number is at about 336. It seems to jump down precipitously each year. They are very highly protected in the United States under Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. And Canada has a parallel law to the ESA called the Species at Risk Act. Um, so they're, they are protected in both countries. Um, and the primary threats to these whales are vessel strikes, entanglement in fishing gear, and the changing climate. So Maine lobstermen have a very long and positive track record protecting whales. We've been involved with this since the process began back in 1997. Um, and over time, we've progressively done more and more, made different changes to our gear to make our gear safer for whales. And you can see the graphic here shows, you know, all of our line between traps now lies on bottom. Um, by doing that, we removed over 27,000 miles of rope from the water. Um, we added more traps to each buoy line um, in 2014. And in doing that, we removed almost another 3,000 miles of rope from the water. Um, recently, we have changed our gear marking, further weakened the remaining line so that if a right whale were to encounter it, the likelihood of the whale getting out unharmed is greatly increased. Um, and this is just an overview of what we have done this year. So as of May of 2022, um, we added even more traps for each buoy. Um, we have now had to comply with a near 1,000 mile closure in our offshore waters for four months out of the year. The lines that remain are weak. Um, we have really ramped up our gear marking. So any fishing gear in state waters is uniquely marked with purple. No other state uses that color. And if you're a Maine lobsterman fishing in federal waters, you have to pair your purple marks with green so that we'll know really the origin of any gear that may unexpectedly find itself on a right whale. So the statistics on this are a little staggering and this is why this issue has been so difficult for the lobster industry. Maine's compliance with whale conservation measures over time has never been below 93%, which is astonishing. Um, by contrast, um, when they did a review of the vessel strike rule, there are a lot of areas um, where compliance was well below 50%. So our track record is stellar. Um, when you look at the data, you know, right whales, when you're taking fishing gear off of them, we've seen a 90% reduction in lobster gear being removed from right whales since 2010. So there were quite a few cases prior to 2010, and there's been only one, which was Massachusetts gear um, since 2010. There are only two known entanglements that have ever occurred in Maine gear. Um, those were in 2002 and 2004. So it's been nearly 20 years since any Maine gear has been removed for, from a right whale. And there are zero records in the federal database that tie any main gear to a right whale death or serious injury. So um, we're proud of our track record and our fishermen have worked really, really hard to comply with these laws to keep whales safe. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about, you know, how these whales are dying. Um, a lot of people criticizing the Maine lobster industry for not doing more. Um, but the facts are this, since 2015, there have been 12 right whale deaths from entanglement in Canada, 12 right whale deaths in Canada from vessel strikes. So 20 right whales have died in Canada since 2015. 
By contrast, in the U.S., six right whales have died since 2015, all of those from vessel strikes. There are zero documented right whale deaths from any U.S. fishing gear um, since 2015. Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, the whales are in your fishing grounds, so you need to do more. So here's a, a schematic of, you know, this down here in the Boston area is where three quarters of the right whale population spend their time in the winter and then up to the north in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and people say, well, they have to swim through Maine to get there. Um, but this track on the right hand side shows um, uh, an entangled right whale in the Gulf of St. Lawrence that was satellite tagged in the path it took to get from the Gulf of St. Lawrence back to Cape Cod Bay. And there are several records of these satellite trackings um, of entangled whales that look very similar. By contrast, this rectangular box close to the main shore, you can see the LMA1 closure, the little gray um, box. Um, that is the footprint of the Maine lobster fishery. So when you hear Maine lobstermen say right whale sightings in Maine are rare, they are. The dots on this chart show documented right whale sightings, and we don't have very many. Um, and they do have a route along the continental shelf that they take to transition between these important habitats that does not necessarily see them going through Maine. Um, some definitely do, but not all of them. Um, and I would be remiss to say um, Bigelow Labs has published a new study and they've modeled um, right whale distribution um, habits based on the availability of their food. And they are predicting that the whales will continue to move further away from the footprint of the main lobster fishery and further north into Canadian, Canadian waters through 2050. So we expect this trend of rare occurrence of right whales um, overlapping with the main fishery to continue um, and actually move further away from us. Um, and just one last slide on the difference between what's happening in the US and Canada. Um, the blue bars represent um, incidents prior to 2010 and the orange bars post 2010. This data goes through 2019. So in Canada, you can see vessel strikes have gone up since 2010. The US vessel strikes have stayed even. There's been a lot of frustration from the fishing industry that the US has not been aggressively managing vessel strikes. Um, the federal government did publish a proposed rule today, finally, um, to put some more measures in place. And then strikingly, the Canadian fishery had hardly any interactions, any documented deaths. Um, but since 2010, they are the lion's share of that. And when you look at U.S. fisheries, our trend has declined. So we still have two in the, the database, not from the lobster fishery, but from other fisheries, but certainly our trend is much more positive than any of these other sectors that are not necessarily doing as much as we are currently doing to protect whales. So if our track record's so good, what on earth is the problem? And the problem is that many right whale entanglements simply can't be attributed to a fishery or a country. So they might get rope, they don't know where it came from. You know, when you look at the rope itself, most of it is very large. It is above a half inch in diameter, three quarters and nine sixteenths, which is actually not rope that you would commonly see fished anywhere in Maine. Um, but nevertheless, they have developed models to try to figure out what's happening and they make a lot of assumptions. Um, and the outcome of that is a 10 year whale plan. This was done under the Endangered Species Act. Um, it's called a biological opinion and our fishery cannot be permitted in federal waters without this in place. So by 2030, this plan requires our fishery to reduce risk to right whales by 98%. So when you think there are zero incidents that we know of of our gear, how do we reduce that by 98%? Um, what does 98% mean? We get really worried about how much of our fishery will be left. Like, what do we actually have to do to get to 98%? And if we do it, are we saving any whales if they're dying due to vessel strikes or are dying due to documented interactions in Canada? Um, so to date, we have implemented our first 60% risk reduction. We checked that off in May of 2022. The federal government is now going after all of the other fixed gear fisheries on the Atlantic coast. So gillnet gear and trap pot fisheries that are outside of New England. Um, the first phase was only the lobster fishery. Phase three for us was supposed to get us to 90%. That was supposed to happen in 2025, but we've now been told that we need to do that immediately. 
Um, so we expect to see some action on that very soon. And then ultimately by 2030, and this could change, um, very likely that this deadline could be moved up, um, they're looking to have a complete 98% risk reduction from all fisheries. If we do not comply, the fishery will not be permitted. So this has led to a lot of lawsuits. Um, the environmental group sued in 2018 over the biological opinion that had been in place at that time. Um, the court ruled that that biological opinion was illegal. They gave the federal government time to redo it. They redid that in 2021. Now we have the 98% risk reduction. The environmental groups reviewed that and said, doesn't go far enough, doesn't go fast enough. So they amended their complaint. The judge just ruled a few weeks ago that now the federal government has again violated the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act with the new biological opinion. Um, fortunately for us, um, the court could have shut the fishery down. Um, if those are invalid, then we are not permitted to operate. Um, but he said that he is going to take some time to hear from the parties in the lawsuit and try to figure out if there's a remedy that can be reached without shutting down the fishery. So we are waiting to hear from the court from that, but the fishery is in a very precarious position. Um, second to that, the Maine Lobstermen's Association sued the federal government in September of 2021. Our claim is that the government has based this plan on flawed data. Um, it doesn't match the data that we see in the records and it is leading to a plan that is literally gonna wipe out our fishery. So. Our court case is fully briefed and we are waiting for the court to rule on that. And our ultimate hope is that the judge will send the two cases back to the federal government together so that they can fix the science underlying the plan and then bring the fishery back into compliance. If we go back without fixing the science, um, it's very questionable um, how our fishery would be able to comply um, with things as they are. Um, there is a third lawsuit hanging out there from the Maine Lobstering Union. It is challenging only the four-month closure offshore. Um, that was filed in Bangor. Um, they initially got a stay from the judge to keep the closure open while the case is decided. That was appealed. The appealed court said, no, you're wrong, judge. The closure went into place. The appeals court recently, they did that preliminarily, did their final ruling saying the closure should stay in place. And now that that case goes back to Bangor to actually be decided once and for all by the judge. But it looks very likely that that closure will remain in place um, as a result of that lawsuit. Um, and just to say a few words about the Maine Lobstermen's Association's case, um, we are in no way looking to make all of this go away. Um, that would be impossible given the laws that we need to operate under. Our goal is to save right whales and the Maine lobster fishery. We want to make sure that the risk reductions we are asked to do actually align with the risk that our fishery is posing. You know, we can't take measures in Maine that are gonna save whales that die in Canada or are hit by a ship in Florida. Um, so our ask, the, you know, the, the true goal of our lawsuit is for the government to fix the data. They're relying on worst case scenarios and holding the industry accountable for right whales that we're not killing. Um, so to fix that plan so that it's, it's matched, Maine lobstermen are implementing measures that will benefit whales and allow us to continue to operate. So um, we've launched a Save Maine Lobstermen campaign. Um, it's very expensive to be in court, the last place we ever wanted to be, but here we are. Um, so we're working at this through all legal and policy arenas. We're also working with the state and other stakeholders to really improve the science on right whales. Um, we're working with our fishermen to innovate new gear. Um, ropeless fishing is a big one that is pending for us and that would be very, very difficult for our fishery to do. And we're hoping that there are some other gear modifications in between that our fishery could continue to adopt to reduce our risk without blowing up the diversity of our fishery. Um, and we're just trying to, to help people understand what the Maine Lobster Fisheries role is in this issue. Um, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and I'm just going to leave you with a few words from a couple lobstermen on this, and then we'll be ready for David. I can't tell you how fortunate I feel to be able to be a fisherman on the coast of Maine. It's a love affair. When you're a fisherman, you're in love with what you do. 
I've been watching fishing since I was eight years old. My earliest memories were coming down to a wharf like this and uh, seeing my father come in with a catch. Being a lost fisherman, I take a lot of pride in maintaining the sustainability of our fishery. We are taught at a really early age that keeping this going is extremely important. What has made the Maine Lobster Hunter so successful is the opportunity to individualize your business. We don't want to become a big boat fishery. Every single lobster is caught and handled by hand, you know, multiple times from my boat to the dealer here and so on. It's all owner operator and it's super small boats from little 21 foot skips to, you know, 50, 60 foot offshore boats. So the diversity of the fishery is immense. The topic of conversation that's been coming up a lot lately are right whales and our interaction with the species. The right whales right now are in an endangered state. We're trying to coexist with them. None of us want to harm a right whale. That would be one of the saddest days of my life if I had come upon that. As things develop, you know, we want to be part of the solution. We're always open and willing to sit down and go over different measures that would work for us and for the species. The lobster industry for the last 150 years has been practicing sustainable measures in order to maintain our industry and keep it successful. We've been involved in the right whale protection since the 90s to try to work along with, with science and different conservation groups. We have to continue to have conversation, but actually listen to one another. This is not an us first them. The thing we're trying to do in these meetings is maintain a safe number of traps on the boat at a time that is safe for the crew to work. But it's not a simple answer. There's a lot more to it. The entire fishery, the whole North Atlantic lobster fishery is going to be part of this conversation. It has to be. We can't, we can't really hold everything up. We're not the whole fishery. You know, there are thousands of other fishermen outside of our waters that are actively working the success of this ocean and this ecosystem and the animals that live within it are directly connected to my success and ability to live here. We work around and live off of lobster in eastern Maine. The rest of the community lives off of our ability to bring the product in. We don't want this just to be a one generational boom. I want my kids to have this opportunity to work here and live here. And I want you know, future generations to have access to this resource. I can't tell you how. There we go. All right. That's everything from me. All right. Thank you very much, Patrice. Um, that was pretty pretty moving and very informative. There was a lot there to, to take on. Um, so I'll just to David, I don't know if you have any kind of reactions or comments to that before we go to question and answer. We've already got a couple of Q&As lined up, but I definitely want to hear what you have to say. Oh, thank you, Patrice, for uh, laying that out like that. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Patrice uh, representing us in the way she does. She works very hard. I've known her for a long time, and uh, I am a member of the MLA and have been uh, for quite a few years now. And uh, it's uh, it's been helpful to have that voice in a place where we, as fishermen, can't really be. Uh, we spend our time out on the water. I spend a lot of time going to meetings. A lot of the meetings that MLA has to go to are uh, out of state, uh, multiple day meetings. Some of these whale meetings, I don't, I don't even know how long they last, but I think a week is not, not out of hand for the, for those things. And I can't even imagine it. I, uh, uh, we're very fortunate to have them, and and I wish every fisherman in the state of Maine belonged to the MLA to, to to uh, help support them and and really be behind what they do. Um, she really laid that out pretty good. I, I don't want to try and add a lot to it. If I, uh, uh, I could cloudy up the waters a little bit. Am I okay? I, I see my videos frozen. Am I coming through? All right. You're still coming through. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, we've been dealing with this for a very, very long time and it feels as a fisherman, uh, my dad fished, uh, I fish one of my daughter's fishes, we're multi-generational and we really want to see it be that way. We want our kids involved. We want the neighbor's kids involved. We, you know, I, I'm apprenticing a kid right now to, to be in the fishery that uh, it really has no fishing background, but he's a hard worker and uh, a young, young person. And I want to see him be able to succeed at it. And I'm looking at him, you know, in the stern of my boat going, what are you even thinking kid? Cause this is, you know, you, we are so up against it. Um, it. It's a very enjoyable job. It's satisfying. We feed a lot of people uh, a, a really nice product. And, but we feel like uh, 
or I should say, I feel like I'm standing in the middle of a, of a field and people are throwing snowballs at me and I have no snowballs to throw back. It's just, it's like we get hit from one direction and, you know, you turn and try and, and get away from that and we're getting hit with something else. Um, it, it would just, I would love it if it was the idealistic little lobster boat cruising the coast of Maine and, uh, you know, everything was good and the seagulls were following you around and you got to see seals and everything was just hunky dory, but it's not really, it doesn't feel that way as much as it, it maybe did when I started. So I would leave it up to questions and, and just say that Patrice did such a good job of, of laying out all of those things. The, these, these things are huge. Uh, they're multifaceted that we're, we're getting hit from several different directions. I, I will say that big block that they've closed on the offshore fishermen, I don't fish out there. My brother-in-law does. I know a lot, a lot of my friends do. It was very odd how that closed because it's a box. It's a huge box and it, it was divided on zone lines. It was divided between uh, area one, which is all of the coast of Maine inshore fisheries. All our lobster zones are in area one. Um, outside of that is area three. That line did not extend into area three at all, which is where that big rope that Patrice was talking about maybe is used. Um, uh, not so much even for our offshore fishermen. They just don't use stuff that big. And looking at that box, I keep saying it, you know, watch the news, wait 10 years, but there'll be wind turbines in that box if we're not allowed to fish there. Miraculously, they'll be okay for the right whales. Um, it just seems too convenient. It's right on the center of the coast of Maine. It divided on zone lines and area lines. And uh, I'm very suspect of it. And the only other thing I will say is that it, from a frustration point is that all these lawsuits go to courts and they're divided. Uh, they're decided by one judge and appointed. It's basically a political position. They're appointed by somebody and they're there to make a impartial decision. And I don't think anybody really trusts that that's the case. Whatever side of an issue you're on, you're probably trying to pick the judge that you think will suit your side of the case. And that that's a problem to me. It's been happening since probably the early seventies. Um, it's a trend, um, basically making law from the bench. I have a huge problem with it and I don't know how we fix it, but it's, it's happening in lo on lots of fronts, you know, there's lots of things that are affected by one judge making a decision and, uh, you know, can affect a, uh, an industry such as ours that, you know, Patrice said a billion dollars and that's a, probably about right. But, you know, the X vessel price was probably 700 million last year, but it affects so many more people. And that's just one year. You know, what about the other 19 years that we want to follow that, the 50 years we want to follow that, you know, so it's, it's, billions and billions and billions of dollars in people's livelihoods. And it's not, it's not just this, it's other, other things where it happens as well. So I guess I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, David. Um, so we have a couple Q and A's and um, I don't know if some of these we might be able to type in answers, but you can also feel free now that I'm in the Q and A, I prefer people add their questions to the Q and A rather than the chat. So I'm not having to manage two rooms or two places. But um, the first question is um, from Bill McWeeny around, he understands no right whales, like Kurt had said in the video, have been documented to be entangled in main gear since 2004, but have any other large whales such as minke, humpback, say, um, have they been accidentally entangled in main lobster gear in the last 20 years? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not on mute. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, right whales are the species that's driving um, the conservation plan and the risk reduction. So that is the species that we focus most on. Um, minke whales are not endangered. Um, humpback whales are no longer considered endangered. Um, and fin whales are also not in the plan. So the, the large whale take reduction plan is set up to focus on reducing risk to right whales and in the process benefit the other species. So the most common interaction you would see for Maine lobster gear is with minke whales. They're a very, very coastal species. Um, you talk to lobstermen, they would be able to tell you, yes, they've seen minkies. Uh, Maine's Marine Patrol um, is licensed to disentangle those whales. So a lot of them are released without harm. Um, and I don't have the data in front of me, but I wouldn't at all be surprised if there had been some mortalities for that. But um, 
according to the federal government, those species are abundant enough to withstand um, a few incidental takes. Um, the species is robust enough. It's right whales that are not able to withstand any of those incidental takes. Can I add okay. something to that? Sure. Uh, just that I have been fishing uh, in the Blue Hill Bay um, uh, area, so Lower Jericho Bay, Blue Hill Bay, for uh, a little over 30 years lobstering and, and longer than that in other fisheries. But in that time lobstering in the summertime, I've seen two finback whales up in that area. Um, just saw them for one day each um, and uh, they weren't entangled or anything and they swam away. So the, even even that sort of entanglement is an off more of an offshore thing than an inshore thing, at least in this part of the, of the state. I mean, other parts of the state, I would say they're almost offshore when they when they leave their harbors. But um, for Penobscot Bay and Blue Hill Bay and Frenchman's Bay, I think, uh, you know, it's very rare for us to see a whale, uh, period. Uh, you know, in that time, two whales in that amount of time, believe me, I spend about a thousand hours a year um, lobstering. And, uh, you know, to have, you know, to only see that many, that's pretty, pretty stark, really, or pretty telling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question from someone working on Harpswell's comprehensive plan. And they're thinking about increasing the number of applications for private recreational docks and wharves. They just permitted a very large marina expansion that's owned by a company that is the largest international business of its kind. The question is whether Maine's lobstermen have any thoughts about these issues and any suggestions that you have for her as they develop Harpswell's plan. Yeah, I would just say that protecting Maine's working waterfront has been a really important issue for all of Maine's commercial fishermen. Um, we don't have very much of our waterfront dedicated to serving the commercial fishing industry. The majority of it is privately owned. So I think on a town by town basis, as you're doing these comprehensive plans, it's just important to look at making sure that there is some working waterfront left for the commercial fleet to work from um, so that we don't lose these heritage industries. I know in Hartswell, um, they had received some of the um, bond funding through the Land for Maine's Future Working Waterfront Program to preserve um, forever um, some of the working waterfront. So that's really a local issue um, that you should be dealing with the local fishermen to really understand, you know, how at risk is Harpswell of not having enough working waterfronts? Um, you know, is there room to diversify that waterfront? It's a, it's a really thorny and difficult issue. Portland's been dealing with it for a long time. Um, but working waterfront, if it all converts, then we have no place to fish from. So the tipping point will vary depending on where you are. Thank you, Patrice. Um, I know we here in Stonington have that conversation daily. So <laughs> it's a very important and timely one. So um, you mentioned that the increase in landings and lobster landings was not the result of an increase in trap pots. But I noticed that on the main DMR website, there were 1 million trap tags in 1970. And in 2021, about 3 million trap tags. Uh, I've also heard that the fishery has expanded offshore in recent decades. Can you comment on this and how that how those changes in effort relate to the changes in catch? Sure. So the, the data that you would be reading on the DMR website are licenses sold and tags sold and not necessarily licenses or tags fished. Um, so you, you would also notice over time there were a lot more lobster licenses sold back in the day than there are now. But when we look at the timing of uh, the limited entry program in Maine and the increase in landings, those really coincide in the 90s. Um, so Maine has had effort controls in place and scientists have, you know, basically proven that the physical abundance, the number of lobsters on the bottom has actually increased um, in large part because of the female protection measures, the V-notching measures, um, the, the number of lobsters on the bottom has just exploded. So we are very efficient at <laughs> capturing, you know, pretty much everything that's legal, that is for sure. Um, but, but the increase in landings has been directly um, tied to the increase in abundance itself. In terms of offshore, um, yes, it is true that more effort is being prosecuted offshore, so outside of three miles. 
Um, but that said, by far the majority of lobster landings in Maine still do come from state waters. They still significantly swamp the landings from offshore waters. Um, only about 20% of our lobstermen are licensed to fish in federal waters. They tend to be the biggest boats in the fleet and that offshore fishery is extremely important to them being a viable business on a year round basis. So we're seeing a shift. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot of concern if something happened with the offshore resource and those boats came back in, um, that would create a real mess. I don't think the inshore stock on its own would be able to sustain everybody who's fishing. Um, but the inshore fishery is still definitely by far landing far more lobster than the offshore fishery collectively. Yeah, and I would just add um, that the timing of 1970 to 2021 and the timing of the increase in lobster landings aren't synonymous. The six-fold increase in lobster landings happened pretty much over 15 years from the mid-90s into the 2000s, where um, we're just talking about completely different sizes of mag orders of magnitude between um, trap tags sold as well as landings of lobster and not over the same time scales. So, yeah. uh, no. can I add what? one thing to that too? Yeah. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the numbers from the 1970s would be very suspect because there were no trap tags in the 70s. We didn't have to have tags until we had limits in the 90s. I think maybe Patrice touched on that, but they, we also have a thing called latent licenses, which is a license that's not used, but they may have 800 tags. And so those numbers are pretty hard to determine who actually is fishing. I mean, I think now that, that they have a much better understanding of who is doing that and the mandatory reporting will will bring that up more. But definitely we saw the increase in uh, catch, at least where I fish, probably I would say 15 years after uh, we were using, when I was probably fishing the 800 trap maximum, uh, you know, amount of gear it was probably 15 years before we saw that kind of a catch increase so that it definitely wasn't just that we were putting more traps in the water there were more lobsters mm. right thank you david uh, so how do the environmentalists respond to mla statistics about no recent main line entanglements or deaths why are they winning in court um I think the concern from the environmental community is that there's so much that we don't know about how right whales are dying. There's so much gear that can't be attributed to a fishery. Um, and since about 2014, if you look at the unknown deaths, you know, so death that's not attributed to anything, over half of those unknowns have no gear associated with them at all. They're simply photographs of a whale or a whale that was not sighted in six years. So there's really no information. Um, so their attitude has been because Maine is such a large fishery, we need to step up and do more. Um, what we wanna do is reconcile the significant shift in right whale distribution and behavior, which really has migrated away from our fishery. Certainly the outer edge of our offshore fishery would pose the most risk, um, but a lot of our fishery really isn't interacting with the whales. Um, I'm very happy to say that the state of Maine um, has been successful in deploying a series of acoustic arrays. So it's too expensive for the state to fly. National Marine Fisheries Service is not flying our waters because whales are so rare and they need to cite them to get them into the population model. Uh, but the state of Maine is listening to them. So we will know if whales are coming closer to shore. They're expanding that array to have some in the closure um, and, and you know, really trying to get those in additional areas so that if the whales do shift and come back in, we would be able to know that. But I think it's a uh, just a difference in perspective on what's what needs to be done to help the whales. Um, they don't have any skin in the game. So, you know, knocking 98% out of our fishery definitely saves the whales. We have the harder question to say, how can the fishery coexist with the whales? And it's just not that simple. We wanna make sure that we're aligning that risk reduction with the risk that we pose. Thank you, Patrice. Um, then how much more gear is being fished now compared to the 70s? And maybe we could see where the gear concentrations are. I think that would help us understand or have a better focus on the issue. 
So I'll just say that um, there is a significant amount of work that's been done there. Um, all of the states contribute fishing effort data in time and space that is all modeled. Um, it is run against um, the known location of right whales, time and space. And then there's another piece of it that looks at, you know, how dangerous might the fishing gear be? So um, there is a very robust risk reduction model. I think there's more work that needs to be done to fine tune it. Um, but those efforts are underway and literally serve as the basis for everything that we're being asked to do right now. All right, we have um, we've got two more minutes. I'm gonna try to combine one person's questions around the likelihood with all these pressures on our lobster fishery, does this increase the likelihood that, cooper that corporations would take over the fishery and um, are we are we at risk of losing our owner operator rule and go the way of the ground fishery of the northwest coast or even the northeast coast? Yeah, so that that is a big fear of mine personally. The owner operator model in Maine is so incredibly important. The fleet diversity in Maine from the 20 foot boats up to the 50 foot boats is so important. And there's a lot of pressure to remove all rope from the water and go to a high tech acoustic ropeless technology. If that's implemented on an area by area basis where you have large aggregations of whales and fishermen are losing access to bottom, that gear makes sense. If people are talking about it as a broad scale management measure that everybody in the fishery has to adopt, then I absolutely think that the big boats will win. It will be a cash hungry business. Um, there will be probably the end of the owner operator, there would be massive consolidation in the fishery because the business model that we operate under now would not survive, um, would, would not survive the transition to that sort of technology. So we've been really working on trying to improve the virtual gear location technology. So can any boat on the water find a lobster trap on the bottom without a buoy? You know, how can you do that in a low tech way? How can you do that across fisheries that have to share the bottom? And if we can figure that out, then maybe the fleet could have a diversity of options for how they retrieve that gear from the high test expensive acoustic stuff for a big boat that could afford to deploy that to lower tech options that would give fishermen a successful way to retrieve their gear. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that space right now. Okay, thank you. We're at the we're at the one thirty, um, and I just want to respect a couple more questions. So if you guys have another minute or two, uh, we've got one question about what is happening with the right whale population. If it isn't these other risks that we, you know, if it isn't entanglements, what's happening with them? Um, so entanglements are definitely impacting the population. Vessel strikes are definitely impacting the population. Um, the question is, what's the origin of the entanglements and the vessel strikes? Climate change has had a significant negative impact on right whales for a period of time. Um, we saw right whales not foraging successfully. We saw reproduction rates uh, drop significantly. We saw right whales, you know, showing that they were too skinny and were looking unhealthy. Um, but 2018 seemed like the bottom of the barrel there. So from 2010 to 2018, things were going down, down, down. Now we are seeing reproductive rates rebounding. Um, we had 20 right whale calves in 2021, I think 17 last year. Um, they are looking healthier. They're looking fatter. They seem to be settling into this new regime where they're foraging successfully in Cape Cod Bay and in Canada. So Overall, the model is showing that the right whale population continues to decline. So it's at 336 right now. But when we look at the individual factors, it looks like things are starting to improve for right whales. What that means, how that's going to translate into the population, I guess we won't know um, until it makes its way through the model. And the other thing that that is impacting this is if they don't cite the whale, it doesn't get into the model. So with the extreme shift in habitat use, it could be that right whales are just in a different habitat and they can't be found. And if they swim back here in 10 years and are found, we could see another bump in the population. So there's a lot that we don't know other than if it's declining, everybody has to do something because the population is too low to sustain itself at its current level. I wanna point something out too here. <laughs> A right whale has not been hunted off the East Coast since I don't know when, um, long, long before us, probably the 1800s, right? 
and the right whale numbers didn't improve in that hundred years. Um, they've been in trouble since the 1800s, since they were over harvested. There was no lobster gear in the water to speak of compared to what there is now all through the last century. And in the early 90s, we were down to, I believe they were counting around 200 creatures, and then we got up to 400. So don't think that, that there was a thousand right whales in 1975, and now there's only 400. The numbers are actually higher than they were in the 90s. Um, and a lot of it cannot be uh, lobstermen's impact of that last hundred years because there just wasn't that much gear in the water. And the gear that was there uh, would have been like manila rope, which would have broken, you know, would meet, would exceed the breaking requirements of what we use now. Um, so don't think, I just don't want people to think that, there, you know, in 1950, there was 3,000 of these creatures and now we're down to 400 because that is absolutely not the case. All right. Thank you, David. And thank you, Patrice, for uh, a great discussion and presentation and for your time. Thank you for those who attended and your questions. It's definitely a um, very broad array of people attended today. And I'll share the participant list with you folks if, if you'd like. Um, feel free to contact us at Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. I didn't introduce myself before, if you didn't know it already, I'm Carla Gunther, the Chief Scientist with the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. I think our next, our August Lunch and Learn is going to be a cooking show. I think we're going to specialize or feature a local chef and our own Leroy Weed in the kitchen, working on some local recipes. All right, well, thank you all. And thanks again, have a good one.